Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. How are you today? Good. My name is Marco Simena. Um, I'm based in Spain, in Madrid. Although I'm covering the whole EMER as a technical solutions architect. My role is about uh, leading software defined and infrastructure innovations and help customers to adopt that innovation to make them more competitive, okay, and to really uh, facilitate their journey into a digital world. Regarding my title, Technical Solutions Architect, yes, uh, for sure I'm a technical guy. For sure, definitely, I'm almost obsessed of giving solutions to customers. The architect part, to be honest, I think it's more like a new name for engineers, but that's fine. I mean, my wife is happy being married with an architect rather than with an engineer, so I buy it ESA. So, real pleasure to be part of this uh, amazing high-level uh, sponsors uh, list, and thanks to the organization to give me this opportunity. I think this remote now work, should work, so let's start. This is the agenda. So we will go through uh, the importance of, of innovation and how important hardware is, layer one is, and having a flexible hardware. We will then jump into how these flexible platforms are very, very important in a software-defined world. And we will go through something really important. I mean, networks, devices, need to interconnect together. So we cannot forget ever about the cabling, about the interconnection of devices that builds a network, right? And then we'll make a some summary, short summary. The content is part, has been built uh, together with my colleague, Peter Jones. Peter Jones is a um, distinguished system engineer. He's in the development side of the house in the IEEE uh, bodies. So let me tell you how important for our customers, for my customers, is what they are developing right now in Silicon Valley. Importance of network innovation and flexible hardware. Let's start with the first point. This is our CEO, Chuck Robbins. So that's a, a quote from him. And from engineering, we always like to correct. It's actually, um, Innovation in the network is what is going to be more important than ever, and I will explain you why. First of all, what we are building is a complete stack. So basically, we are building an intuitive network or intuitive solutions. Cisco is a system vendor. It's a solution vendor, not an ASIC, a software or a device vendor. It's a solution vendor, so a solution starts by the high level, so defining the intent and having the right platforms to implement that intent. Let me put you an example. Your intent might be, I want sub-second convergence in my core campus network, right? That's an intent, that's what you want to do. The what? You want to give a high priority to your critical application or to your voice over IP. That's an intent. The intent, the what, doesn't change in time. How I do it, how I do implement it, that might change. Depending on the technology I have underneath, might be LAN, might be wireless, might be routing, it might change in time, different versions, different devices might implement that same service, that same intent in a different way. So it's very important to be able to define what you want to do and let somewhere else, someone else, something else to program it for me, okay? And at some point, I want this network that has been programmed to define and to implement that intent to give me information back because my network grows, my network changes. I want to keep constantly feedback up to that part of the intent so that my intent is still valid and I need to reprogram the network again if needed. So what I'm talking about is a stack. We are talking about the stack from the application level back to the controller, to an operating system able to adopt that intent and to the layer one, the ASIC part, which is the topic that we will focus on today. So that's why it's so important to build the right foundation, the right foundation to be able to adopt 
and to implement what I did define via software. This is the best combination of both worlds. A highly rich feature underlay, feature rich layer one to be programmed, but via software, which is the agile part of the, of the story. Um, ASICs, so one point here is that <coughs> ASICs are not flexible, ASICs are not programmable. Why are you talking about ASICs, Marcos? Well, this is the reason why we develop our own ASIC. It's an ASIC able to be programmed. It's an ASIC flexible enough to implement and to protect in the investment. How can be a flexible ASIC protect your investment? Normally, you invest in vendors that are trustable, that they are robust, that are reliable. Why? Because you invest and you can somehow foresee a life cycle, a long life cycle, because it's robust. But what about that investment adapting to your new needs? The big change we are proposing here is building network devices, ASICs, able to adapt to your future needs. And these needs, by the way, you might not even be aware of what you will need in five years, for example. If you invest on something that is programmable, a new standard will come in three years, Cisco will decide if this is important to the, for the market to implement that new standard programming the ASIC. ASICs by default are not programmable. They are fixed. This picture shows a traditional uh, ASIC and the processing pipeline. Both the parser, the pipeline, and the lookups, and so on, they are fixed. ASICs are very good in doing what they were built for. Right? So an IPv4 packet gets in and gets out. That will work. Light rate speed. IPv6, that will work. An MPLS packet, if that ASIC was not built to support MPLS, it will drop that packet. It's not flexible enough to support every protocol or protocol that will come in the future. That's the reason why we are now proposing a flexible or programmable ASIC that we call UADE. In this case, we have the parser, the pipeline, the lookup, and the rewrite flexible. Let me put you an example. MPLS as before. This is something that in order to implement MPLS, we need to have several boxes to implement MPLS. There is some recirculation because it's an encapsulation protocol, right? Either the ASIC supports it or not. That's why in Cisco or other vendors, there are switches that support MPLS and others that don't. And those that don't will never support MPLS. It's too costly to implement something in an ASIC that is not supporting it. Now, in this case, if we consider it, we will enable MPLS in the ASIC. The software will have the code, and it's about programming that ASIC. So basically, this flexibility is aligned with your business needs. This is really, really uh, important. Programmable ASIC. What is an ASIC? Look at this picture, I like it. It's about cost, performance, and flexibility. Programmable ASICs have the best balance between these factors. CPUs, for example, the CPU is software-based. Uh, Cheap, right? It's very, very flexible. It's cost effective, but what about performance? You know that anything that we enable in a CPU will drop the performance a lot. What about FPGAs? They are programmable. So they are pretty flexible, but they are costly. They cost a lot. It costs a lot for developers to develop uh, uh, FPGA based solutions. The ASICs, the ASICs are extremely fast. They do only what they do, so they are not flexible at all, but they are really fast and pretty cost effective. A programmable ASIC takes the best of both worlds. It's flexible, it's programmable, and it's very, very fast. And the cost is really in the in-between. So it has the best balance. Now, how do, do we implement features in a programmable ASIC? Well, this is the summary of a 50-slide presentation. 
So let me bring it very, very simple. But it's about marketing. We hear customers, we hear your needs, we look at the market trend, and we decide to implement a certain feature. Okay? This gets to the ASIC engineer. The ASIC engineer, he will build an ASIC um, um, architecture document that will basically start to code. They code at a very low level uh, coding languages, okay? And this code gets converted to logical gates, which are chips, basically. So we get that new feature in this new ASIC, sorry, this new functionality in the ASIC. Okay. Um, are we talking this UADP, the first ASIC Cisco develops? Not at all. We have been developing ASICs since the beginning. We are probably the main silicon vendor in the world and in the history. And this is important for you to know. Now, maybe a little of history catalyst 3550, 3750 with different names. Look at the, I think it's interesting, the amount of lines of code and the amount of transistors that there are inside those chips. And look at the UADP. We started with the UADP in the 3850, like seven years ago, probably, seven, eight years ago. And look at the number of transistors. We are now reaching the one billion, three billion transistors in a chip. So you know what? Our new platforms, Catalyst 9K based, they have new versions of this UADP, and look at the UADP 3.0. Almost 20 billion transistors. Almost 20 billion transistors in such a thing. This is a UADP, if you want to see it later on after my, my speech. These are transistors that are 22 nanometers of size. A hair. Sorry, I heard of you, I, I don't have. It's about 100K nanometers. These transistors are 22 nanometers in order to be able to put 20 billion of those in this time. Okay. Now, um, this is interesting because again, eight years ago we have this chip. It took us four years to develop it. Versus software, software is pretty easy to somehow develop it, to make it, ASICs are really expensive and really difficult to implement. So we can say that we have this chip since 8, 9, 10 years ago. Today, we support features and protocols in this ASIC that didn't exist when it was built, like DXLAN, for example. I will repeat this sentence. This chip nowadays is able to do or to implement features and protocols that they didn't exist. This means that it will be able to support protocols in the future that don't exist today. Investment protection. You see the power of programmability? We listen to your needs, we listen to the market, and we, we consider we will implement it in programming it without removing your current gear as we did in the past 15 to 20 years. And by the way, we are talking about layer one, A6, but it's the complete stack. You don't care about VXLAN, ERSPAN, or flexible parser. You have some needs on top. The message here is that we, are, we have all tight. We have the complete stack. Without the complete stack, it's useless to have a very powerful programmable A6 or a very an amazing application on top. We need the complete stack to bring solution and systems. Otherwise, something will be missing. And we are not the first, by the way. You see there in that picture some examples that are following this same philosophy. So you developed an ASIC. Nice, so you only support that in that ASIC? Indeed. But you know what? We have this same ASIC in all of our portfolio, in every single Catalyst 9K. From the very low end, up to the high-end modular core. So you can expect that same capabilities, features, roadmap in your whole campus end-to-end. -end. The difference between one and another platform, you will have more of those or less of those in order to support the scalability or the performance they need. Let's go to the next topic. Um, Marcos, this is great, but 
you are not talking about our needs, our challenges as a customer. This is nice, looks great, looks promising, but what about our challenges? Okay, let me go back to the top level, to the software defined. I'm pretty sure you are quite aligned with these challenges that you have. You want to do secure onboarding, bring devices to your network in a secure way. That's what networks do, by the way. In that simple sentence, it means a lot of things, but you basically want to ensure that a user, a guest, or a device connects to your network, gets correctly authenticated or validated, and you put it in the right segment from a security perspective. All that process needs to be automated and needs to be secure. The second pillar, networks are too complex to manage. Give me a solution that for me is able to adopt all that innovation that you are bringing to me. It's irrelevant. Let me put it this way. We don't want, or I don't want to call it innovation until you declare it innovation. Otherwise, it will be new feature, unique feature, no doubt, interesting feature, but we want Cisco to define, you define if it's innovative or not, if it's relevant or not. And until now, we were developing a lot of new things that were irrelevant for you because we didn't bring the right tool to adopt them, to enable them. You didn't have enough resources or expense to enable those supposed advanced features, right? So give me something to make my networks more easy, to adopt the value of your features and declare them innovation. And the last pillar, slow issue resolution. You're with me. Until now, it's extremely difficult and costly to troubleshoot networks. They became too complex. They were fine until now, but this is becoming too complex. The amount of user, devices, IoT, and you know the message, right? What I like about having a solution that narrows down the problem is that you are saving money, basically. Engineers, professional engineers, tech engineers, they are too expensive for troubleshooting, and to troubleshoot, by the way, layer one issues. That has, it has been said in previous, um, with my previous colleagues, presenters, it's 80% of the, of the problems in a network, right? That's too expensive. Let me reduce that time, let me save money, and maybe use that, that buffer for something relevant to my business. Solving a spanning tree loop doesn't bring anything to your business. It's pure troubleshooting. So again, we try to bring as well the right tool to make this troubleshooting shorter. I used to work in TAC, in post sales, in Cisco. I liked it, I learned a lot, no doubt. But you know what? I realized that the best post sales engineer in the world, the most brilliant guy in the world, in post sales, he will leave the box or the network as it should which is working, right? You bought a network in order to make it work. Post sales is really tough, to be honest, if you think about it. Because the best I can do is to leave the network as it should, which is working. So this is a very interesting point. Now, what did we build to address those challenges? Software defined access. It's basically, if you remember the stack at the beginning, from the application up to the infrastructure, down to the ASIC in order to bring a solution, agile, easy to troubleshoot, and so on and so forth. These are the three big pillars. We are basically treating my complete network as a single entity. It's what we call a fabric. So a fabric is basically a switch which has many ports as access ports you have. Those ports, by the way, can be layer two, layer three, wireless, wired, encrypted, not encrypted. It's a single system, okay? Now, this system is about an underlay, and it's about an overlay. The underlay is very robust, it's what doesn't change. It's a layer three underlay. It doesn't fail ever, and it's very basic, by the way. It's a pure layer three connectivity. And we are bringing all of our advanced services on top via an overlay. And just curiosity, we are using LISP and VXLAN.
So this is interesting because I am unlocking the underlay, okay, from an overlay where I implement my advanced features end to end. So all the segmentation, the VRF segmentation, all the encryption and so on is not dependent on my underlay, but just on the on the devices that implement the overlay. So Marcos, this is interesting, but we are in layer one. We were talking about the ASIC. We were talking about the UADB. What has this to do with the ASIC? Well, you know what? This overlay can only be implemented in a programmable ASIC. And here is the point. I'm addressing, we are addressing your problems, your challenges via software, and we need to program and to implement them via uh, hardware in the ASIC. Let's continue, because I said that this was about networks, devices, but what about the interconnecting these devices? What about the layer one from a cabling and protocols perspective? Faster and slower. I hope this information from our development and standard body folks uh, you find interesting. I found it, and they are really up to date. What is Ethernet? Because, by the way, we still depend, at least in IT, on Ethernet, right? Ethernet, and this is uh, Mr. Bob Metcalf, uh, the, the, the guy that invented Ethernet, has several attributes. These are some of the key ones that you recognize, right? High speed, multiple physical media, copper fiber. This was huge at that moment, at the beginning. It's a standard, interoperability, plug and play, right? Backwards compatibility, I think this together with Wi-Fi, so in, in general 802.3 did a great job from a backwards compatibility together with DOE. Today we support 90 watts, but we don't go up to 15.4 watts, right, in 3AF. So the backwards compatibility was great, and we could support any protocol on top. IP has been the one selected, but Ethernet had that capability. Okay, what has been the evolution in Ethernet? And see, you might be surprised. Look at the speeds and the years. So we started with 10 meg, right? We continue with 100 megs. We continue with 1 gig, 10 gig, 100 gig. By the way, you see the, the trend, right? We multiply by 10. But at some point, I don't need 100 gig. I have other needs. And look at this. In orange is what we built from 80s to 2016. From 16 to 18, 2018, we started to develop new speeds, up to 200 and 400 gig. But what about today? What, where is the market going? 4 gig is getting down, and 100 meg and 1 gig is getting down. I'm talking about the access in copper, 100 meg, 1 gig and in the analytics, 40 gig. Is this true? Well, this is based on what we've seen. So let me show you something. What is dot point five? Dot point five is M gig or N base T uh, alliance that well, we call it M gig, right? But it's really a, a, a standard today. It's a copper ethernet technology able to go at 2.5 or 5 gig. Why is this relevant? Because based on the SRIA, in 2020, 2021, the main cabling category will still be 5E and 6, that they don't support 10 gig. So what happens if I need to keep my cabling and go beyond 1 gig? I have to develop a new standard. Okay? I have to develop a new standard to support new speeds. What I was so happy to listen to this because for once in a, in a long time, the standard, the IEEE, was looking on how to be relevant to the business of our customers. How they could be useful for the needs and not just multiplying speeds by 10 once and, 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 and again and again and again. And by, by the way, multiplying the price as well. If I can have a similar price, reuse my cabling and give up to five times more of a speed, that's what I need in order for my investment in the future. This uh, picture is really interesting. Look at the gray at the bottom, 100 meg. 
Now, it's history, but it has been a great history for all of us. One gig, by the way, by far the most developed access, over access uh, speed and technology. But look at 2019, 2020, it's declining. Why it's declining or based on what? On other technologies like the 2.5 and the 5G. You see, it's ramping up. Because if I'm proposing five more speeds reducing my cabling at a similar price, that's clear, right? What we should invest. And by the way, you can see at the top, 25 gig and 100 gig and 40 gig, other technologies that are also ramping up. And this is more for the athletes that I will cover now. So, we had, and personally, uh, Peter Jones, my colleague, he was very involved in trying to uh, standardize, to propose something to the IEEE for 2.5 gig in copper. There was a big need in the market. So it started in 2014. In two years, we had the standard. This is a record time. Normally, Ethernet, it takes four, five years for standards to get ratified. We could make it in two years because there was a need, and the IEEE were aware that there was a need in the market of 2.5 and 5 gig copper. Um, so what is the evolution on the top, on your left, in the access? If I'm evolving from a switch perspective, 48 ports, 1 gig, I'm evolving to 48 ports, 2.5 gig. Okay? And base T. At the distribution, I'm going from 48 gigs to 40, 48, 25 gig. And I will mention now the 25 gig. Look at the bottom on your right, the uplinks, how they support, or they are built to support 25 gig. This was again something, you can see at the bottom, that as well from Cisco we saw. In 2015, we claim a, what we call a call for interest of 25 gig. Why? Because the adoption of 2.5 in Ethernet was not enough to get 10 gig in my uplinks. We needed consistency from an architectural perspective that we are getting with more speed, I need higher uplinks. And 40 gig was not the choice, as we said. It's declining, it has some challenges with the cabling, with the distance and so on. I need to reuse my cabling, my 10 gig cabling, two fibers, LC connectors, I want them to convert in a higher speed than 10 gig. So we proposed 25 gig, and it has been standardized also in two years. So you see how everything is coming, and for me, that I'm a sales guy, technical but sales guy, I'm happy because this is really fitting the needs of the market, and not what the standard bodies thinks the market needs. Again, two years, record time to standardize 25E. So, you recognize this, probably most of you have this type of topology of a speech, I hope of devices, but anyway. So you get in one gig, uplinks in 10 gig, and you go do your core in a three layer topology to 40 gig or 100 gig. This is the evolution. And again, this is the evolution without disrupting your cabling plant. You can reuse all the cable, cabling you have and convert the speeds to these amounts that you can see. Going starting in 2.5, going to 25 gig, and rolling 100 gig to the core. More interesting is that yes, you need to acquire, you need to to get a switch that supports 25 gig in the access and the distribution. Now, in our case, on the market in general, we support SFPs of both speeds, 10 gig. You take it or 25 gig. This is interesting, but much more interesting would be to have dual rate SFPs. So an SFP that can go in 10 gig or 25 gig with the same fiber. Why? Because you might be ready to invest in the access with 25 gig uplinks, but your distribution might not be ready yet. You still to keep your distribution at 10 gig. So you can invest in 25 gig optics start at 10 gig speed and tomorrow once your distribution is ready convert that in 20 gig with a single command in your switch the same for 40 gig and 100 gig we have dual rate 
40 gig, one. So you can have a mix and match in your campus. You can, you define the speed of the migration. We cannot force you to go to something that you are not re yet ready. Depends on budget, depends on many things. But the new investments should be ready to support 25 gig. In the meantime, you can keep 10 gig, you can keep um, 40 gig or 100 gig. These are just examples of SFPs from Cisco. Uh, at the bottom, the 10, 25 gig, remember, two fiber uh, LC connector. And at the top, the 40, 100, in this case, the BD. So reusing the two fiber LC connector, you can go also at 40 or 100 gig. In this case, 100 meters instead of 300. But that's fine. So you see how you can evolve from one gig, 2.5, 5, 10, 25, 40, 1 gig with minimum investment. This is the key message. And again, I'm happy to speak about this because this was not the case in the past. We needed to remove my complete optics or cabling in order to adapt to new speeds. Um, a very interesting topic here as well. Hey, Marcos, can I convert 140 gig ports into four of 10? Breakout cabling, breakout technology? The answer is yes. Can I convert one 100 gig port into four 25 gig? The answer is yes. So we should add to this slide the breakout capabilities. In order to start in 10 gig, 25 gig, remove the breakout cable and go to 100 gig in the future. Again, extremely important to depend on all this ecosystem because it's about giving you solutions and not giving you uh, isolated technologies and, 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 and solutions. One, uh, 10 meg, we said that 100 meg was dead, that one gig was slowing down, 2.5 was ramping, 40 gig was slowing down, and 25 gig and 100 gig were ramping up. What about 10 uh, meg? Oh, forget about it. We don't use it anymore. Hold on, let me surprise you. Remember this? Who was here 20 years ago in this IT world? Some of you? you you're shy, I have a, you're somehow declaring your, your age. Anyway, remember this? Yes, right? This happened. Some of us, we leave this, this momentum, right? All, all these protocols moved to PCP IT. It was early 90s, mid 90s. Now, what are we seeing now? Again, what do we see in the market? Hey, Mr. Standard Bodies, this is what we are seeing. What can you propose? What should we do in order to help our customers grow and adapt? It's not about only innovation, the latest of the latest. It's give me the latest, but let me put the latest coexisting with my current uh, environment. So basically, we are trying to bring all the bus industrial and building management lighting systems into 10 meg Ethernet. Okay, so this is what we are proposing now with something we call SPE, that probably single pair Ethernet we will cover in this session because we have our colleagues from, from Panduit and others that are also leading this technology. And talking about Panduit, let me show you this example. In their headquarters, huge buildings, huge campus, they invested 600,000 feet in four pair Ethernet. Basically, the Ethernet you know, right? The four pair one. They invested almost the same length of cabling in single pair or one pair uh, technology, but not Ethernet. But in order to give service to their industrial um, windows managing and, 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 and sensors uh, technologies. What if we could bring to those 500,000 feet of single pair and put Ethernet on top and connect the industrial and the building management system into that Ethernet protocol? Why Ethernet? For the reason we saw at the beginning, because it has some key attributes that makes Ethernet very, very interesting. So this is SFP. And basically, this is, I think, my last, uh, one of my last slides before the summary. It's where we are going now. There is this new standard uh, being built 
this is somehow the definition. You will have these slides uh, with you. The, uh, the length, so 1,000 meters, uh, compact connectors. So really the benefits is about this slide. It will be simpler installation, operation and troubleshooting because we know Ethernet already. Higher bandwidth that other protocols, layer two in this case protocols can provide. And the most important one, the cabling topology, your cabling plant can be reused. So again, we give a solution and we adopt value. We give something, a value easy to adopt. So it reduces for sure the adoption of Ethernet. That nowadays is a challenge. Summary. So innovation, access, network intuitive, layer one, the whole stack. This is basically about building the foundation. We want to build layer one, both at the optics level and at the ASICs level, but not just for, for fun. It's really to bring it to products the more product, the better, to give solutions. Cisco is obsessed, and I think now the standard bodies are really aligned with giving solutions to challenges in the market. And these solutions, of course, need to have benefits for our end customers. So that's the critical role of the flexible silicon, in this case, the UADP, really amazing topic, a lot of information in the internet, by the way, how these guys can make this happen and making an ASIC programmable. So that's all, uh, building on a strong foundation is the key to keep on building the rest of the software-defined uh, uh, part of the stack. Thanks a lot.